my research topic in life. And so for well, at least three decades now, Buddhist contemplation, Buddhist philosophy, and so forth has been what I wrote about, and thought about, and talked about, and so forth. So in that sense, the definition of contemplation, which is a term I'd like to use today, has been the subject matter of my intellectual life ever since I was an undergraduate. But the last couple of years in particular, it's been a different type of definitional challenge that I faced. Because about three years ago, when we at the University of Virginia began to talk about contemplative sciences and establishing some type of broader initiative here, Honestly, I didn't know what people were talking about. People were using these words like mindfulness and meditation and contemplation. I hadn't been paying attention at all. I mean, I did this in my private research, I did it in my classroom, but professionally I was very involved with Tibet, doing a broad variety of things that were way outside of my disciplinary expertise. And I didn't notice that the world in the United States had kind of passed by me. Because when I first came to Virginia some uh, 23 or 24 years ago, no one was talking about these things in an ubiquitous fashion through the University of Virginia amongst administrators and faculty and so forth. And so to suddenly wake up and find myself three years ago at a place where everybody was doing yoga and talking about mindfulness and saying, oh yeah, I meditate and so on. I remember at one point I was meeting with the college uh, deans and associate deans and I, I mentioned how surprised I was by how often people were engaged in things that they self-identified as meditative or contemplative. And Bruce Holsinger, who was the Associate Dean of Humanities at that point in the music department, he said, well, who doesn't do yoga? And I just thought, you got me. I mean, that, that was new to me. I really hadn't noticed it. And so I thought a lot about, what, what do they mean? What, what are they talking about? What are they engaged in when they identify these practices in this way? What, what benefit are they deriving from this in this American culture that we live in? And what do I mean by it when I'm going around like a used car salesman promoting contemplation and meditation and their benefits in a broad variety of social sectors? So I've been thinking a lot about this question, this definitional question of just what is contemplation? And I have a fairly long, polished explanation of it, but I'm getting tired of it, honestly, because I've been doing it for several years now. So I'll give you a little bit more of a polished explanation until I'm cut off by my time limit. But I'm going to start with just some more stumbling reflections about how we would go about thinking in relationship to this term contemplation. Obviously, we could think about its provenance in religion. We could do what I've done for much of my academic life, which is look at a specific religious tradition, its history, what they mean by the word contemplation or meditation or its analog in the various languages that pertain to these traditions. And we could look at the broad typology of different types of practices. For example, in Buddhism, you have empathy cultivation, attention training, visualization, performance training, somatic meditations in the middle part of your body, uh, emulations of the process of dying and sexuality, a whole variety of things that I could tell you in great detail about. This is a, that is something I actually do know a bit about. Or we could also look at the term in context, in our context, because it's one thing to say what Buddhists were doing, what we imagine they were doing is typically very different from what they were actually doing. So if our interest is in contemplation here at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, United States, and various kinds of social sectors, we can take a more ethnographic perspective and see how are people using this term. And it's a term, contemplation, and it's different correlates like mindfulness and yoga and meditation that are in clear danger of becoming completely bankrupt. We had a presentation by someone who was looking at mindfulness as a social phenomenon in the United States, and the height or the depth of his presentation was when he revealed to us that there's something called mindfulness mayonnaise. <laughs> and this was in the context of an endless stream of consumer advertisements for mindfulness products, and it culminated in mindfulness mayonnaise. And we never quite understood what mindfulness mayonnaise was. I didn't know if it was made by elves in the North Pole, very mindfully, you know, very quietly, or the stillness of the Arctic solitudes, or whether it just was really a euphemism for organic. That was quite surprising. <laughs> But uh, clearly there's a tension, and we also see this tension here at the University of Virginia as we try to think about what contemplation might mean and how it might parse out in different parts of our uh, intellectual and, and social community. Between the tension between being broadly engaging and um, being uh, incoherent. Now, I definitely tend on the broadly engaging. Almost everything I hear, I think it's contemplative in one way or the other. That begs the question, what does it mean to be uh, contemplative? These days, for example, sustainability, I went to the sustainability retreat in August, and I immediately recognized everything that was being talked about is 
as contemplative, and they were even using one of our favorite words. You know what that word is? Resilience. Resilience. Yeah. And Karen McLaughlin was telling me that they were thinking about using resiliency as a framework instead of sustainability. That's one of the privileged terms in the contemplative science community for thinking about what we're doing and what these practices are fostering. Resilient individuals, resilient bodies, resilient communities, resilient institutions, and so forth. So anyways, the other one is entrepreneurship, which I spent a lot of time talking to Sean Carr and others in, in Darwin and so forth about entrepreneurship, which I have totally recognize now as a contemplative endeavor which is a surprise to all my humanistic colleagues over in the college. <laughs> but Sean and I, I recently bought the domain Contemplative Entrepreneurship. Because Sean and I thought, hey, it's out there, let's go grab it. And that was after I did a search on Contemplative Entrepreneurship, and I found the first five hits were the University of Virginia. <laughs> surprise to me, right? So since we own the Contemplative Entrepreneurship field, I bought the domain. So now an associated uh, challenge in terms of what is contemplation is what does it mean to be contemplative? Because we use this word contemplative, just like we've been using the word mindful, as an adjective that we attach to well-known activities. And I often wonder, so what magically happened when we attach that uh, adjective to, for example, reading? What's the difference between reading and contemplative reading? Between entrepreneurship and contemplative entrepreneurship? Between nursing and contemplative nursing? Between learning and contemplative learning? Between, and then it goes on and on and on. Parenting, sexual relationships, museum tours, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Everything can benefit from the word contemplative being put on it, but what does it mean? One of the things I love about contemplation as opposed to meditation is that contemplation is a term that has an extraordinary spectrum of meanings. Uh, for me, contemplation was primarily when I started this stuff out, this very complex and often mind-bogglingly complex Buddhist forms of personal experiential practices that you engage in. Sometimes simple, but sometimes extraordinarily complex. And as I began to talk to a broad variety of people over the last couple of years, it was really interesting to me how they used the word contemplation. For example, um, one of our ex-mayors, whose name I'm forgetting, David, anybody? Norris. Norris? Oh, Dave Norris, yeah. Is it Dave Norris? Um, he's a doctor? Yeah. Okay, it's another ex-mayor anyways. <laughs> shows you how well I know him. But we were talking, and uh, he was really focused on this, he had this experience of teaching disadvantaged youth to how to play soccer. And he said the most important thing I ever taught them was to contemplate. And I thought, oh really, you're teaching contemplation. And what he meant by that was he taught them to take a pause, a pause between a situation that emerged and their reaction to that situation. So they're out there on the soccer field, someone elbows them, and instead of smashing the person back, they stop for a moment and think, okay, what just happened? What do I want to get out of this? What am I going to do? And then he said, go ahead and hit the kid. I don't care. I just want you to take that contemplative moment and pause and consider your situation. For another one, I was talking to uh, Jim Burroughs, who's a senior marketing professor in McIntyre. And we had this long, he's got a very contemplative background in many ways. His, his mother is really into India and yoga and does these crazy pilgrimages and so forth. But uh, Jim, very contemplative figure in his own right. And he kept talking about contemplation in the sense of he just wanted his McIntyre third year students to take a moment and be reflective about what they were doing and why they were doing it. And he felt if he could, through his teaching and through his mentoring, introduce that reflective moment, it could have a transformative impact on the half of the students he said were held in for um, Wall, Wall Street without really considering why they were doing that or what values they were exemplifying or trying to align with and so forth. And finally, Dory Fontaine, the Dean of Nursing, who implemented, along with others, this notion of a contemplative pause within the operating theater. Namely, when someone passes away, they take 60 seconds to consider what just happened. 60 seconds, that's it. That's the contemplative pause. Not they're not doing anything particularly, they're just being quiet, stopping their activity, their transactional activity, and reflecting on the fact someone just died. And this has had a huge impact on the people who have participated in that. So, from that spectrum, what an amazing spectrum for a single term to kind of cover. And so when I think about contemplation and what it means to be contemplative and so forth, reading versus contemplative reading, entrepreneurship versus contemplative entrepreneurship, one of the things I came to uh, seems extremely simple, but when you look at Tibetan Buddhist practices and their accounts, they talk about contemplation as always having a beginning, a middle, and an end. That seems extremely simple. But when you begin to unpack that, I think it's one of the keys to thinking what we actually mean when we talk about contemplation. Because I was trying to figure out what is contemplative reading? What do we mean by that? And so the beginning, we, we mark it. It's a formal demarcation. We say, now I begin. 
I watched my daughter, like my daughter was over my house last night, who we were just talking about, her. she's an artist, and she struggles with words. So she was trying to write a statement for something, she just trained in you know, ESL. She'd been there for eight hours writing that damn statement. And I wasn't there, so I came home and there was like literally half a page of the written of the statement. Meanwhile, there was a television over there, her phone was over here. There was nothing formal whatsoever about what she was doing. She hadn't demarcated it. So there was no beginning point that said, that in Tibet there's a whole language around demarcation, around boundaries. There's boundary stones, there's boundary markers. So you mark a boundary. You mark a physical boundary, you mark a temporal boundary, you mark a boundary in all these spaces that says, now I'm engaging in this activity. And in addition to marking a boundary that formally demarcates it and says, I will be absorbed and focused in an integrated way on whatever I'm doing now until I come to an end. And there's a conclusion that's also a formal thing that says, now I bring it to an end. Now I dismantle the boundary. Now I move back into these other domains in my life. That initial moment, that beginning moment, is a reflective moment where you ask, why am I doing this? Why am I reading today? There's just a moment, it's not a very um, lengthy moment, but it's a scripted moment where you engage in a process of considering why am I doing this, what values am I trying to exemplify, what do I hope to get out of this, and then you bring that to a formal end, and then you engage in whatever the practice is. And there's also a concluding, there's the main phase, which is most of what we think of as contemplation, and then there's the concluding moment where you actually take stock, what happened, what were the experiences I did, how do I want to bring these experiences into the life which I will now engage with? And you formally think through those, and you bring that into the activity. So when we were talking about the museum, and we went to visit the Phillips and so forth, and thinking about contemplative encounters with art, or contemplative museum tours, and I did a lot of work with tourism in my life, not as a tour guide, but working on tourism, uh, sustainable forms of tourism back in Tibet. So I thought a bit about tourism in that way, but I began to apply those kinds of lessons. So we often think it's intentional, and I think that is an important part of this, that it's intentional, that you're asking questions about your intention, it's deliberate, um, et cetera. But I think that can also lead us astray if that's the only definition we have of contemplation, that it's slow, everybody wants to think contemplation is slow, you're quiet, oh, you're gonna have a center, that's great, you can go there and be quiet. And they're very surprised that I speak very fast, for one thing, so I'm not slow. I'm also not very quiet, I'm loud. But I also think contemplation should be something like you go over to the eye lab in Darden. That should be a contemplative space, or it could be a contemplative space. Namely, contemplation can be something that also involves spontaneity, that involves the social dimension, that involves us contemplating a form of art, or contemplating each other, or contemplating the rapid dynamics that happen between a group. So all of these things can be brought to bear on that as well. Okay, I think I've been, um, I don't want to exceed my time. So let me just see how uh, long. Oh, uh, okay, so I only have a couple minutes left. So, my form, more formal presentation, I'll just kind of skip over and give you the highlights of it. So early on when I tried to think about, so what is contemplation, here's what I came up with. Uh, I'll give you about five quick rubrics and just quickly summarize them. The first thing is practice. Uh, the word that people use who engage in Buddhism, for example, in English, they always use practice. They use that much more than meditate or contemplation. They talk about practice. I'm going to practice. So I've thought a lot about what we mean by practice. And I think one way to start with thinking about contemplation is that we are a product of processes and practices. There are processes that constitute who we are, biological, emotional, cognitive, aesthetic, and so forth. But there are also practices that we engage in. And those practices generate outcomes, but we're largely unaware of those practices. And so the second aspect of contemplation, or this way of thinking about it, is that it involves reflexive awareness. It involves bringing our own awareness to our own processes and our own practices, and beginning to recognize that those are constituting who we are at any given moment, and that they have outcomes. And that these outcomes then, number three, is the notion of plasticity. We talk a lot about plasticity these days. Plasticity of the brain, plasticity of the body, of emotions, etc. Of things that we thought were hard-coded in our childhood or our disposition and so forth. And increasingly research is showing us that there's this tremendous plasticity. And so how do we take advantage of this plasticity? How do we use our powers of human self-awareness and cultivate a variety of practices that use concentration, breathing, posture, visualization, um, cultivation of emotions and so forth, in order to bring these practices into the light of our own self-awareness, so that with them bringing into the light of self-awareness, something happens that's intrinsic to the fact that it's our process, it's our practice, and it's our awareness. Namely, there you go. <laughs> Everyone has no patience. Um, namely that 
they become plastic, they become malleable. Suddenly we realize, oh, we can change this. We can be a different in our emotional responses. We could be, we were just talking about my, I was giving a hard-coded reference to myself, primarily textual person, my daughter, primary visual person. We have a lot of problems relating to each other. She walks into my house, she's very disconcerted because it's visually all jarring to her. Whereas I'm like, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> have you written that paper yet? Oh, no, 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 no. So, anyways. Um, but we could change. I could be more visually uh, appreciative. She could be more textually orientation. We tell these stories. So we could call that the kind of quantum effect of self-awareness. When we bring it to our own processes and practices, it changes in the moment. Just like when we're in the height of anger, we pay attention to the anger, and suddenly the anger takes a hit. It changes in quality, simply because we brought our relationship to that. And so things that seemed impossible become possible. And finally, uh, the issue then is, once we see that malleability, how do we take advantage of it? And that's where the main part, not the beginning and the conclusion, but the main part of the contemplative practice is, we use practices of breath, of awareness, of attention, of posture, of movement, of analysis, of reflection, of visualization, of performance, of stillness, of emotions, of sound, of aesthetic appreciation, and so forth. And we work with these practices in a broad variety of ways. We have a grammar, those are like the, uh, the vocabulary of contemplation, but then there's a grammar of contemplation, how you put these together. Um, and these practices then enable us to adjust and change the practices once we catch them in the sight of our awareness, and then deeply integrate them into ourselves and begin to make those the new norm of who we are. But that norm has to be reflexive and responsive because our situation changes, and we have to adjust those in the future as well. So in general, uh, that's what we've been talking about in terms of contemplation, that by doing this, another the final part of this is to think about the values that we're trying to align with, what Jim Burroughs was talking about with his McIntyre students, that if we know, if we see the values that we're exemplifying in our behavior, we're often shocked at them because they have nothing to do with the values that we declaratively say that we're aligned with. And so contemplation is a way to both catch sight of the values that we communicate in the fabric of our lives and adjust that message or those values alignment that are being represented in the behavior that we do rather than the statements that we make. And so in general, we've been talking about the notion of uh, contemplative literacy, becoming literate in ourselves, in our body, our speech, our mind. And so finally, contemplation for me has brought me back to one of the most unsexy words of all, which is learning. It's all about learning. And what do we do in learning? How are we trained as professors with our lectures and our small seminar discussion? Pretty woefully inadequate, if you ask me. And so I see contemplation really in the end here at the University of Virginia as a way for us to reimagine the possibilities of how our students can learn and how we can learn and how we can interact through that mutual learning process. So thank you.